join us and uh, give us an opportunity to minister the word of God to you. Uh, at least we try as much as possible by the grace of God in this church for those of you who join in either through online or face to face uh, that we try to we assure you that we make a door homework in make in preparing a real solid meal from the word of God so you can learn from it okay that's uh, basically our mission here is to preach the word and to get people both believers and unbelievers to get to be to know God's word it's amazing how time is flying we are now in the 20th of February next Sunday is the last Sunday of February and then before you know it it's already March and then Lenten season na okay biro niyan mag mamahal na araw na so uh uh time does fly isn't it and uh that's why all the more we need to be praying that prayer of Moses that the Lord teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Time is something that we do not have the luxury of. Okay? Uh, we have to redeem the time knowing that the days are evil. So uh, again, thank you for joining us. We just finished our study uh, uh, from the book of Colossians and I trust that you have benefited from it for those of you who have missed it of course we have it all uploaded in our facebook page foundation baptist church or in our youtube channel and for those of you who kind of have a hard time sometimes our uh, internet connection does fluctuate at least uh, once it's uploaded it's a youtube uh, channel natin yun eh tuloy tuloy yan pero kumbaga syempre replay na lang yun so, but nonetheless, we are thankful for the joy, joyous privilege and honor to continue to serve him through these uh, services that we have. So uh, we are going to start a new series this morning. Of course, you know, I was thinking and asking the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to preach to your people? And I thought it was a little too early to start any series on the Lenten season, whether the seven last words or the the inspired record that led to the crucifixion or uh, just focus on the resurrection etc so as I was asking the Lord I thought you know we should have some kind of a two to three part mess series before we go to that so I thought we'd go through some lessons on divine providence and therefore because we're talking about the divine providence of God we are going to look at the historical narrative once again from the book of Genesis. So turn your Bibles please with me in Genesis chapter 37. This is partly a, a this is basically a character study on the life of Joseph and how vital le the lessons we can draw from his life. <coughs> uh, he is a man of like passions as we are. He lived in a sinful cursed world just like we did different a little bit of different circumstances of course different country different culture but nonetheless uh, the lord uh, allowed him to go through some trials that uh, uh, we can learn from okay so um, turn your bibles to genesis 37 we shall read verses 18 to 36 for this message so shall we all stand please to give god due honor and reverence Excuse me, Genesis 37, verses 18 to 36, reading it responsively. And when they saw him afar off, referring to Joseph, even before he came near unto them, they conspired, that is his brothers, conspired against him to slay him. Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into some pit and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams and Reuben said unto them shed no blood but cast him into the spit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again Of many that was on 
And they took him and cast him into a pit, and, pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it that we, if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Then there passed by Midianites merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Moses out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites, for twenty pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. And he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father, and said, this have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. Verse 36, And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. Father, we come before thee thanking you for your inspired word and for the incarnate word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity and the privilege this day to serve you. We thank you for your faithfulness, your mercies, and as always, we thank you for Calvary, for all that you've done to reconcile us unto yourself through the substitutionary sacrifice and shed blood of your sinless Son. Thank you, Lord, that we can enjoy fellowship with you in spite of us, all because your Son satisfied your outraged righteousness and holiness when he became sin for us, he who knew no sin, so that we might be made the righteousness of thine in him. And Father, for this reason, we are thankful. We pray that we may worship you in, in a manner that is well-pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. We pray that you'd fill us of thy spirit as we sing the hymns of the faith, as we encourage and provoke each other to love and to good works, and as we listen to the preaching and teaching of your word, let thy spirit freely work in ministering, speaking, convicting, encouraging, consoling, whatever the need might be teaching us, so that we may be more and more conformed into the image of your Son, especially for those of us who are already believers. And Lord, for those who are listening here right now or watching who have not trusted in Christ as Savior, we pray for your Holy Spirit to freely work in bringing him under or them under conviction so that they too can flee from the wrath to come by finally taking refuge in Christ as personal Savior and Lord. Father, we acknowledge we are a needy people and uh, we... We are totally dependent upon you, but we thank you that your word assures us that we are complete in thee. Thus, we come before thee with our needs. We pray, Lord, for, uh, for uh, those who are ill. We continue to pray for Rupert's complete recovery from Angie's uh, results of her bar exams. We pray for uh, um, um, Frank also, who has had to go through this uh, surgery regarding her throat, his throat. Uh, <clears throat> we pray for many others who are still wrestling with some health issues, including our, our friends uh, abroad, Dr. Peterson, uh, Pastor and Mrs. Moss, and uh, many others. We continue to pray for each and every one of us and all of our needs, maybe some of us wrestling some physical ailments, hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, cholesterol problems, respiratory problems, whatever the case might be, we thank you, Father, that these are your reminders that we are still trapped in this aging and aching body and therefore should all the more look forward to that day of the resurrection when you will change our vile bodies and fashion it after your glories and resurrected body. 
But while we wait that day, Lord, help us to present our bodies to you as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto thee, which is our reasonable worship or service. Father, we pray uh, that uh, we will learn to see how your grace is always sufficient, no matter how deep the problems or the physical or spiritual hurdles we are faced with, and that we may draw upon your eternal resources, for we know that faithful is he who has called us. Thank you, Lord, that you care for us, and uh, as the Bible assures us, so that we can cast our cares upon you. Lord, we also remember to pray for uh, our professionals as they earn their living through honest gain during the week, and our students as they rub shoulders with unbelievers. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, help us to bear fruit of converts, fruit of character and Christ-likeness and conduct that will back up our witness so that you would be pleased in using us to draw sinners and even saints uh, or among our constituents unto thee. We pray, Lord, that um, we will be vibrant and fruitful witnesses for the gospel uh, as we continue our earthly sojourn, regardless of what station in life or age group we may belong. Help us to be outspoken for the, for the word, and as we just sang, help us to be standing on the promises and, uh, uh, of thine and uh, openly declaring to uh, unsaved people as well as to those who know Christ the Savior. Of our of our relationship with you and of and of the grace that has drawn us to yourself through the cross of Calvary, Father, we remember to pray also for people in authority. You've commanded us to pray for them so that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We therefore pray for their salvation. Open their eyes to their need for the Savior. They are just like everybody else, sinners deserving condemnation, and Lord. Some of them may have been drunk with power. Some of them have been duped and been swallowed up by the system, been allured by it, whatever the case might be. Lord, open their eyes to the reality still of their standing before you and that they need Jesus Christ to the saving of their soul. We also pray, regardless of their standing, that you grant them only the, wi the wisdom that you alone can provide so that the decisions, the policies that they craft with all help to improve the quality of life of the general citizenry. But as like we learned from the study of the book of Kings and Chronicles and Samuel, Lord, no, we believe that our, we know that our hope is not in any earthly king, for our hope is in thee, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And therefore, even for these upcoming elections, I pray, Lord, for this country. We pray, Lord, uh, that uh, more people could be reached with the truth of the gospel, the 120 million Filipinos, 110 or 120 million Filipinos. We do not in entertain the delusion that we can bring all of them to thee, but you know you com we, know, we know you have commanded us to bring Christ to them. Help us to be able to do every opportunity to do, to do this so that we may finish our course and finish it with joy until we can say like Paul that we are clean from the blood of all men. <coughs> not only in this field, but also the field, fields beyond uh, our shores. We uh, pray for, uh, uh, continually, for our, our, not only our missionary in Palawan, we thank you for the opportunities you've had to support other missionaries before. We were the prospect of starting also work in Bagu with our new contacts there, and perhaps in many other fields, whether here in the local scene or abroad. We thank you for the brethren who partner with us to continue to expand your kingdom, advance your kingdom through the preaching of the gospel until you finally come to establish your kingdom. We do not desire to establish or advance our own kingdom and therefore help us to be faithful in carrying out the Great Commission. We also um, <coughs> uh, pray that to help us to in the light of local or domestic and international or, or global events, we realize that your coming must be sooner than we think. And therefore, as we have been seeing in the Old Testament, how you uh, intervene in the affairs of human history, how you use kings and rulers and kingdoms <coughs> and governments to ultimately accomplish your divine purpose, we thank you that you are the sovereign king, the Lord of Lords, but in the midst of all that is taking place with this pandemic, we pray and look forward to things going back to normal should you 
allow this to happen, but we realize that the stage is now being set for the coming of the man of sin and the Antichrist. But while we continue to see all of these things unfold, help us, Lord, all the more, not to be discouraged, but rather to all the more occupy till you come, knowing that uh, when, you, as your word tells us, when we see these things unfold, we should be not, we should be looking up for our redemption draweth nigh, and therefore help us to occupy until you come, to find us faithful, serving you, uh, and uh, living for you both in our homes and uh, in, our, in our church and in our field. We pray for our loved ones, our, our, especially our children, as we've been learning, uh, how generation after generation, the next generation, we may lose the next generation, maybe because of our faults, sometimes because of their own, but whatever the case might be, we just pray that uh, help us to continue to propagate the faith uh, in our own family, in our own loved ones, in our, in our own amongst the friends, neighbors, and in the, to the world eventually uh, as we rub shoulders with unbelievers as well. Father, we uh, now ask that you prepare our hearts as we look to your word for instruction. We ask that you'll open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Help us to receive the word with meekness, the engrafted word, which is able to save or deliver our souls. And we shall thank you for it. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> okay, we're starting a series today on the lessons of divine providence in adversity. A uh, study, a uh, character study on Joseph, of course, the story of Joseph is recorded for us through the inspired pen of Moses from Genesis 37 all through the rest of the book of Genesis. So there's a lot to learn here, but as we know, according to Romans chapter 15, the Apostle Paul tells us that whatsoever things were written aforetime, why, what was the purpose for its writing? They were written for our learning so that we through patience and comfort might have hope. Romans chapter 15, verse uh, 4, I believe. See? So they are written for learning. Okay? For our, and who was Paul writing to? He was writing to the Christians in Rome. And therefore the whole book, the whole Bible was written for believers. So let's all be reminded of that. Okay? From Genesis to Revelation, God's inspired word was written by men who were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they were written for the believers for the believer's growth and edification. They were not written for unbelievers. Unbelievers will not read the Bible normally. I remember reading the Bible, the, some portions of the Bible, because it was only required in class before I got saved. But the whole Bible was written for believers. Even those passages in Scripture that talk about how to be saved is written for believers to tell unbelievers how to be saved. John 3.16, John 3.18, John 3.36, John 5.24, and all those other parallel passages. It's for us believers to be familiar and equipped to let others know how they can be saved and get right with God. So, but we're looking at a portion of Scripture, the book of Genesis, the life of Joseph, and with all those chapters from 37 to 50, that's quite a long uh, uh, chunk of Scripture, we will be looking at a particular episode in the life of Joseph. Uh, Joseph in the Old Testament. Okay? And uh, Joseph's story, as you, if you have read it through, is a fascinating story of divine providence. Full of profitable lessons for us eventually so that we may learn from. Okay, so, um, yeah. Full of profitable lessons for godly life and service. Joseph knew how to be abased. He knew how to be. He knew how to abound, just like the Apostle Paul. But he learned the lesson of contentment, regardless of the circumstances he found himself in. You see, so there are actually two characters in the Old Testament that there were. While all are sinners and have come short of the glory of God, Romans chapter three twenty three tells us there are two characters in the Old Testament that. As they are presented in Scripture, it is almost, we know they are sinners also, 
But they are recorded, their lives are recorded in scripture as if almost they had no flaw. One is Joseph. Who's the other one? Daniel is the other one. So perhaps we'll get a chance to study the book of Daniel sometime in the future. There's a lot of prophetic literature there too. But we're focusing on Joseph this time. And uh, like I said, it is full of lessons for God in life and service. It's a story of divine providence. The doctrine of God's providence. You know what providence means? The word providence means it is the work of God wherein He, God, preserves and governs His creation. And that's the God of the Bible. In contrast to the God of the deists who believe that God created the world and left the world to run its own course. Pinabayaan na tayo ng Diyos. Sometimes we feel that way when we feel abandoned by God while we're in trial. But that's not what the Bible teaches. In contrast, of course, to the God of the, uh, of the atheist. Because he, the, the atheist says he does not believe in any God, but he is, he is uh, contradicting or always fighting God. And if he didn't believe in a God, then who is he, who is he fighting against? Okay. In the contrast of any other different worldview, the Bible does teach that God is involved in the affairs of human history, in the affairs of men. We see this very rampant and very evident in all of Scripture. I think it is Brother June Rukagawa who is going to touch on the book of Esther. That book does not even mention God once in the text. But the hand of God is evident everywhere else. And this is the God of the Bible. God preserves and governs His creation. So whatever you and I are going through at the moment, we know and we have the assurance that God is involved in what we're going through. That's why we can claim the promise of Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. So this is what we will see in the life of Joseph. In adversity, he quietly trusted in God and patiently waited on God's time. That's hard to do, isn't it? Waiting on God because we are all lacking in patience. In time of prosperity, he humbly leaned upon God and found God's grace sufficient in all of time. What a blessing this man is in his day and continues to be a blessing to believers today. Okay. And if you've studied through Genesis 37 to 15, read through it, and I encourage you to go through it as we go through this study for the next three weeks. I hope you will see carefully and study carefully how God was involved in all of the human history, including this particular episode, so that in despite all the troubles that Joseph had to go through or allowed God allowed him to go through. You remember his powerful statement of faith in Genesis chapter 50, as he told his siblings, you meant it evil, but God meant it for good. See. So in that passage alone, we find both doctrines, human responsibility, the doctrine of human responsibility. You meant it for evil. Joseph did not say, thank you for selling me to the Midianites. Otherwise, it would not have been Pharaoh. He did not condone their error. You meant it for evil, Joseph said. Therefore, the doctrine of human responsibility. But God meant it for good. The doctrine of divine sovereignty. See, that's very prominent in the, doc in the Old Testament. The sovereignty of God. God uses the stubbornness of men and even angels. As we were talking about it earlier in the Sunday school. He uses the stubbornness of men to accomplish His divine purpose. And what a blessing it is to be assured of that even today. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As we study the life of Joseph, God allowed Joseph to pass through three powerful tests. He passed all of them summa cum laude. First is the test of adversity. Second is the test of allurement. And third is the test of advancement. Okay. And in all of these tests, 
God, we see the character of Joseph. He never was a blame shifter. He never put his, he never allowed his most unfavorable circumstance to be the reason for his, for giving in to carnality. Isn't that typical of many of us? I am like this because of you. Uh, I was forced by my circumstances to sin. Okay. I hit my sister or my brother. Or I, I hit somebody else because I ate too much pizza. Did you know that's, a, that's even sometimes being accepted in, in courts, in the courts of law, in the United States? Sumobrang kinain mo ng candy. You know, sugar makes you hyperactive. And therefore, too much candy can make you hyperactive that you might hit people left and right. You see, so don't eat candy is the lesson. <laughs> We're naturally blame shifters. Thankfully for Joseph, this was not the case. That's why we said he knew how to be abased and he knew how to abound. In a time of adversity, he waited on God in his divine providence. In the test of allurement, despite all of the opportunities for him, conducive it might be to satisfy the flesh, he learned to say no. When he was already the Pharaoh, in the time of advancement, that was another test. And sometimes when people are blessed with plenty, then they fall into sin. As a matter of fact, there are more people who fall into sin in times of plenty than in times of adversity. But in every circumstance, we find, despite the shifting of circumstances, when, the divine, when God's divine providence frowned on Joseph or smiled on Joseph, Either way, Joseph's character stay, remains steadfast. What a blessing. It's not because of anything that he, he, he did. It's all because of his gra God's grace. So we will look at these different tests for the next few Sundays. And for the first, we will look for this message, we'll look at the test of adversity. Obviously, Joseph was, uh, went through a real tough time. You say, what is adversity? Adversity uh, how, how do you define adversity? Okay. Adversity is winds coming at you at the contrary direction. Have you ever been through a situation like that? Everything that you do and everything that you're going through seems to be, the circumstances and the winds seem to be contradicting, going against you. Opposition. Okay. Adversity is opposition with a spirit of animosity. Hostile circumstances invading our lives. And some of us perhaps are going through that at the moment. So we go through difficulties, sorrow, hardships. And you know what? Many of God's people are subjected to this. Maybe you're going through the test of adversity. Therefore, let us learn from these inspired texts and how God used Joseph in the time of adversity it could be in the midst of adversity that our greatest motive it would be our greatest motivations for spiritual growth but it could also be our deadliest means of discouragement have you ever been to such a tough adversity that you almost literally gave, have given up okay Winds of animosity were constant, one after the other, and then you almost said, you know, it's not worth it. Why, and everybody else is just compromising. I might as well cave in and, and accommodate to the world. See, perhaps some of us are going through that, but hang on, brother, Christian. These are moments where this could be our greatest motivations for spiritual growth. It could also be our deadliest means of discouragement. The difference lies where? On whether or not we understand God's purpose for adversity. You see, in the midst of adversity, God has a divine purpose. And His purpose is always good and just and loving and holy. It's always consistent with His pristine character. But in the same adversity, Satan has his purpose. And he wants us to succumb to his purpose, to be bitter, to be angry at God, to be doubting God and doubt his promises. 
And therefore, the choice is ours. Whose purpose are we going to succumb to? This morning, we will look at the purpose of adversity. Why does God allow us to go through that? And to begin with, turn with me to the book of Psalms 119. Verse verse 67. Psalms 119. Perhaps you're going through tough times. It could be in your office. It could be a situation in your home. Or whatever the case might be. Psalms 119. Notice in verse 67. The inspired word of God wrote, written by David. He said, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Before I had to go through adversity. But now I have kept thy word. God has a purpose in allowing us to go through adversity. Notice in verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted so that I might learn thy statutes. David came to the point of seeing that affliction, adversity was good for him. Who, who among us naturally want adversity going to our life? Winds of the currents always go against us. It's never to be, it is never a pleasant uh, situation to be in. But it is interesting, David said at the end, it is good for me that I was afflicted so that I might learn thy statue. So God has a purpose for adversity. Adversity drives a man to the arms of Jesus Christ. It teaches him to wrap around the mighty promises of God. God allows us to go through the school of Christian experience so that we may learn lessons from Him that we will never learn in Sunday school or in Bible school. So He allows us to go through tough times in the school of Christian experience. So that we can learn our lessons well. And perhaps you're going through that right now. And make sure that you will learn your lessons well. So that at the end you wait on God and can say like Joseph or like David. It was good for me that I was afflicted. And what was the purpose? He said so that I might learn thy statutes. Well wait, what, was, what happened to Joseph anyway? What was his situation? Well we see here. Uh, Joseph was scorned by his brothers. He was sold by his brothers to the Midianites. And he was subjugated by his owner, by Potiphar. You see, of all people, normally the place where you find solace and comfort is the place called home. But in the case of Joseph... It was his own siblings that scorned him, that sold him. You don't think that was painful? What a despicable thing to do. For your own brothers, your own siblings, your own family, people who are close to you are the very ones who will sell you and abandon you, throw you to the pit, plan a plot to even kill you see this is the situation that Joseph went through he did not equate however in the in the regardless of the circumstances he found himself in Joseph did not equate God's blessings with creaturely comforts isn't that typical God is blessing me because I finally hit the lotto at least I'm not using the term sweepstake anymore. Huh? <laughs> Some people think that God is blessing them only when I have plenty. When I have creaturely comforts. Joseph did not see it that way. Of course, he understood that it did cost to be a believer. And therefore, there were times that God allows us, his people, his, his children to go through the periods of suffering and adversity. In the case of Joseph, notice again what he did, what, ha- what happened to him. He was scorned by his brothers. Going back to Genesis 37 and in verse 4. When his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren. They hated him. 
and could not speak peaceably unto him. Okay. His very own siblings na inget their envy. You see, I mean, let, let me remind you, according to scripture, ang inget, envy, if you don't check that in your heart before God, it can bring you far, far away from God. It was so in the case of Joseph's brethren. Okay, when they saw that he had a coat of many colors, and they thought that Jacob was playing favorites, so that they thought the father, his father loved him more than all his brethren, they what? Hated him. And could not speak peaceably unto him. Do you have siblings like that? Do you have family members like that? You cannot even talk to them peaceably. Would you turn your Bibles to James chapter 3 while your fingers in Genesis 37? I'm inserting some insights here. Although there's a lot of material already in our notes. James chapter 3. The entire chapter talks about the power of the tongue. But late in the latter part, notice what it says in verse 16. Uh, verse 14, or, or rather 13. Who is, a man, who is a wise man and do it with knowledge for, among you? Let him show, if you are wise, out of a good conversation or conduct his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom, did you notice here what the Bible says? This kind of wisdom, where there's bitterness and, and anger and clamoring in our hearts, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but it is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Obviously, the Satan's hand or the, de the devil's hand was behind their envy and hatred. But verse 16, uh, 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable and gentle, easy to be entreated. That simply means it's reasonable. I'm reading verse 17 of chapter 3, James. Full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. See? So he was scorned by his brothers. Joseph was a dreamer. Okay? During those days, the Bible, of course, was not complete, even the Old Testament. So Joseph was a dreamer. They were rejoiced. They, were, they rejected Joseph's dream. Joseph had a dream that eventually he will be providing for not only his family, but also for the nation. Okay? For Egypt, the, the world power of the day. So that was a revelation from God. And that was his word. That was the word of God. And here was Joseph simply expressing what God showed him in a dream. It was, event, and yet it was not welcomed by his own brethren. It is a hard thing to be hated for announcing and living the truth of the word of God by those who are close to you. Did not Jesus say that your enemies sometimes will come from your own home? 2 Timothy 3.12, the Bible tells us, all those who desire to give, live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Of course, the family is the basic unit of society. And that's where it is God who established the family. But sometimes in the family, there are people who will not love God, who will not follow his word. And they will, that is where some of your worst enemies will come from. Just as in the case of Joseph. People will either show their highest admiration of you when, if you share the word of God to them, God's revelation to them. They will show their highest admiration or they will show their deepest animosity. I've seen this in real life. Even in personal experience. As we will see it and therefore as I go through that occasion I find myself seeing, you see the Bible is really true. It can happen to your closest kin. They may be the ones to show the, 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 the most intense animosity because of your stand for the word of God. 
While he was a dreamer, he was never a schemer. In other words, he never manipulated the substance of those dreams. He believed in the mighty power of God to meet his needs. Because faith is living without scheming, without, being, without deceiving. And Joseph was such a man. I mean, what a blessing this man was. His character ought to be, uh, uh, to be emulated for all believers to follow. So not only was he scorned by his brothers, he was sold by his brothers. Let me just read verses 5 through 8 as part of the scorning of his brothers. Joseph dreamed a dream and he told his brethren and they hated him yet the more. That did not help, isn't it? You know, I heard a, a revelation from God and the, oh, these brothers said, oh, here we go again. Here I have pray, I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves, etc. And you, you know, the, you know the story. Eventually, he was going to provide for them. Jumping down to verse eleven, and his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. So they had hatred, they had envy in their hearts toward their own brother. Notice in verse 20, come now, therefore, notice there how they were pl planning to betray his, the, uh, him. Come now, therefore, let us slay him, cast him into some pit, and we will say, some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. What a despicable thing to do. So not only did they, did they scorn him, they sold him. Verses 23 to 28. With a passage we already read. See, His brother's heartlessness was revealed in this portion of scripture. Their envy translated from thought to action. From inside to outside. It was a conspiracy. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7 tells us. Proverbs 23, verse 7. Says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. See? See, that's the problem, see. As a man thinking that we cannot read the thoughts of men. You cannot read my thoughts unless I blurt it out to you in my words or in my actions. And vice versa, see. So apparently, thankfully, we have an inspired record of what took place. The Holy Spirit revealing their innermost thoughts while they were scheming and planning against Joseph. See, they were enjoying a meal. While they were enjoying a meal, notice in verse 25, and they sat down to eat bread. And as they were eating bread, they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing some spicery and balm and myrrh, and going to carry it down to Egypt. Imagine, enjoying a meal. And then they were scheming to sell, to sell his, their own brother. They were, they, while they're enjoying a meal, they were, while bartering for personal gain, they were, they were bartering for personal gain. And by the way, you know, if any, some of us might be watching this and some of us might have been a conspirator to a situation like this. You know what? Genesis 42, verse 21. Let's jump fast forward. Genesis 42, verse 21. This is some years later, and they said one to another, we are, very, we are verily guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul, and we, he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. In other words, what does it tell us? Their guilt never left them even years later. 
You can just imagine how their conscience kept known, gnawing at them, bothering them for selling their own brother. I mean, today, of course, it happens. Sometimes children can get to be so rebellious over to, to their parents. Or sometimes some parents have no care for their children that they will literally abort, kill their babies. Without natural affection. What a despicable thing is happening in our society. Thankfully, at least in this country, abortion is still not legal. But in some parts of the world, it is protected by the law. In some parts of the Western world, it is not only protected by the law, they, they have permission. A young person has permission to have his, her baby aborted without informing their parents. They are not compelled to tell their parents. And this is protected by the state. This is the state raising their arms of rebellion against God. We will conspire. We will protect and console. And rather, uh, um, we will cuddle these criminals, these rebels against you, God. The height of rebellion. An expression of the depths of human depravity is being displayed in passages like this. No wonder Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. That phrase desperately wicked means it is incurably sick. Who can know it? Nobody can. And that's why it says only the Lord searched the reins and the hearts. The depths of human depravity are so deep nobody can comprehend it. How can such a brother, a sister, a mother, a child rebel and yet appear as if nothing happened? What a despicable thing to do. This is what Joseph went through. You see, from the, the parable of, this, of the Good Samaritan, we don't have to turn there, but at least we can learn of three kinds of people in this world. First, there are those who beat others up. Those are the sadistic. They were the thieves in the parable of the Good Samaritan. The second kind of people are those who pass others up. People who passed by. These were the Levite priests in the parable. They are what? Narcissistic. They don't care. If the world is going to hell, if people around them are sinning, as long as I live for myself, so they're just passers-by. And of course, there are those who help others up. That's the Good Samaritan. They are sympathetic. What kind of a person are you, Christian? If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, apparently you will show sympathy around those who are needing help. Not only was he scorned and sold by his brothers, he was subjugated by his owner. Subjugated means to be enslaved. Joseph had no rights. We see that in Genesis 39. Jump down, fast forward, and jump forward. Genesis 39, 1 to 6. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, <coughs> an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him, uh, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph. That's all that mattered. And he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hands. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon him, upon all that he had in the house and all in, in, the, in the field. And then he left all that he had in Joseph's hands, and he knew not aught he had, or anything he had, everything he had, and saved the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Here was a man who came from a totally dysfunctional family. 
And have you seen people, and in fact, al almost all of us, I'm almost sure, <laughs> come from a dysfunctional family? And have you seen people blame their family for their carnality? Here was a man coming from a dysfunctional family, and yet he was from dysfunctionality to usability. He was greatly used of God. Because what mattered to Joseph is that the Lord was with him. As the text says. But even before that happened, you know, all of the, the rest of the narratives tell us how he was subjugated as a slave. You see, the... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, he understood that God had a purpose in all of what he was going through. That God's purpose is always righteous, just, good, and loving. Sometimes God's purpose is unknown. Sometimes God does not reveal his purpose. But we know his purpose is good and just and loving. It's consistent with his character. This was, this was the case of Job. Job was breathing in pain from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. And why was he going through all of that? His friends told him, you had sin in your life. You, that's why you're not, that's why you're going through this. These were his charismatic friends. He said, it's always God's will for you to be healthy and wealthy. And therefore, the fact that you're going through tough times, therefore, there must be sin in your life. You know, these prosperity gospel preachers. Joel Austin. Joyce Mayer, uh, Kenneth Copeland, Hagen, and such like. And we have some local counterparts here, by the way. Sino mga examples na mga counterparts nila? Si, sino? Almeda? Oh, eh, hindi na masyado nakikita si Almeda, eh, di ba? Sino ba itong si, ano? Si Mike v Velarde. Yan. And sometimes, yeah, sila, sometimes Villanueva, you know, see, you just, you, the more, basta, you, you need to give. That seed you have to give, and therefore, the more you give, God will be the one to bless you. I mean, they barter with God. They make a business transaction. God, I'm going to give. Na utang ka sa akin. We give because of what we receive. We don't give in order to receive. That's what the Bible says. Because there is nothing we have that we did not receive in the first place. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says so. So in the, in the case of Joseph, okay, he was a slave. And because he knew God's purpose was always consistent with God's character, he purposed in his heart. Okay, I may be a slave right now, but therefore I will be the best slave in Egypt. Did he sit down in the corner and says, Ako na yata pinakawawang hudyo sa mundong ito. Biro binenta ako ng mga kapatid ko ngayon. I am a slave, etc. No, we don't see that trace in his heart. He said, I'm a slave. I'm going to be the best slave because God has a purpose. What a blessing this man was. And continues to be. He understood the eternal purpose stated in Romans 8.28. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Even before that was written in the New Testament. He understood that everything that happened happens within the confines of God's plan and purpose. And you and I as Christians need to find comfort in that truth. Whatever plight or circumstances you and I may find ourselves in, God has a purpose. For as long as it's not sin in your life and you have, not, you have no unconfessed sin, if you have unconfessed sin and you're going through some trouble, then you're just reaping what you've sown. You need to get, get right with God. Confess your sin. But other than that, God has a purpose. He wants, to, he wants you to grow. Even when there's sin in our life, the Bible promises in Hebrews chapter 12, God spanks his children, so he spanks us in order to grow. Joseph was learning that before he would be entrusted with life's advancement to become Pharaoh, comes the tests of life's adversity. So God has a purpose 
for, God, for allowing us to go through moments of adversity. And no matter how painful the adversity might be, okay, God's purpose remains intact. What kind of adversity does God use to help us grow? Number one, the kind of adversity God most effectively uses to help us grow has three characteristics. Number one, pagkakinagat ka ng langgam, ah, oh, this is adversity. Kagat ng langgam? Three kinds of adversity that God helps us to grow. It is greater than our ability to resolve. Number one. In other words, it leaves us in a state of helplessness. Have you been to a situation like that? Lord, I'm totally helpless. I'm looking at the blank wall, staring at the blank wall. I don't know what to do. God allows us to go through moments like that. He allowed Joseph to go through that. Number two. It invariably costs, in, come, rather comes in multiples. What does that mean? In other words, sunod-sunod ang problema. Hindi pa nga tapos yung problema, ito na naman. At pagkatapos dumating itong isa, ito na naman. It comes in multiples. As the saying goes, when it rains, it pours. Are you going through that? God has a purpose. Number three, it is almost always incomprehensible. You just cannot understand why is this happening. Can you imagine to me, perhaps there were moments in Joseph's life when he would think through that. Why did my brother sell me to the Midianites? What did I do to them? I cannot understand what is going through their mind. It's just incomprehensible. But they did. But while it is incomprehensible, we can nonetheless see with the eyes of faith that God has a purpose. What a blessing. You see how different the Bible's teaching with some of these prosperity gospelers? Oh, God has a wonderful plan for your life. This could be the best day of your life. <laughs> Stay as a slave, Sabi ke Joseph. Can you imagine if Joseph was listening to old Joel Osteen? <laughs> Best day of my life. I'm a slave here. But God has a purpose. So, let's get to the meat of our message. Point number four. What are God's purposes in times of adversity? Well, number one. It may be disciplinary. 1 Corinthians 11. Remember the Corinthian saints? They were a carnal bunch of believers. So much backbiting, bickering, strife, envy, toleration of immorality, and at the same time of false doctrine. What a carnal bunch of Christians. That their carnality was so bad, it manifested during the worship service, during their Lord's table. As they were partaking of the Lord's table, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, they were partaking of the Lord's table unworthily. So what do we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 20, 30 to 32? Let me draw your attention to this passage. We go through this every month during our communion service. But notice what 1 Corinthians 11 says. What did God allow some of these Christians to go through? Verses 30 to 32. For this cause, because they were partaking of the Lord's table unworthily. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. But if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. You see, God was disciplining some of these carnal Christians of Corinth. They lost sight of the real purpose of the Lord's table. Christian, bear in mind, remember that life is built upon universal, non-optional principles Revealed in scripture. God set those principles in, in his creation. And therefore if we disobey God's principles. We can expect divine disciplinary action. The Lord's table was intended to picture. So that believers can remember the Lord. His, his death. 
his burial, and his resurrection. That his death was number one, sacrificial. That his death was selfless. That his death was a powerful manifestation of God's love for us. And as believers who are recipients of God's grace, that we should be expressing our gratitude. That's the Greek word, Eucharistia. A Eucharist, it's our way of saying, thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me through your sacrificial, selfless, and, um, and powerful manifestation of your love for me. And do we reflect these in our lives? Apparently, this was not seen amongst the Corinthians, and therefore God disciplined them. And by the way, when God deals with us in this way, disciplining us, it means God loves us. Hebrews chapter 12, 5 through 11. It's evidence that we are his children. See, God has a purpose. Second, why does God allow adversity to come our way? Well, it may be a deterrent. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. A deterrent. That does not mean, I mean, the first one, we committed sin, and therefore God is chastising us. Point number two, it is a deterrent. Here in the case of the Apostle Paul, he had not yet sinned. And lest he sin, God gave him adversity. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, notice in verse 7. It says, and lest I should be exalted. Did you notice? Lest I should be exalted. Above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. See? In other words, remember the apostle Paul was the man that God used to write 13 New Testament epistles. Inspired epistles. And he mentions in the first few verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the person he was referring to did not name it. It's probably himself when he saw God in the third heaven. He said, I cannot tell. God knows. Fourteen years ago, I knew such a man in the body and out of the body, how that he was caught up in paradise. So here, here is Paul talking about an experience. And no wonder he has had such a glimpse, a vision of God himself. So that God radically used him. And who? Who? Who has ever seen a vision of God will ever be changed. Or who will ever stay in his old sinful life. Here was a man who received abundance of revelation. No wonder he was radically transformed and used of God. And lest he should be exalted above measure. Para hindi siya matangay sa yabang. Ang dami kong tinanggap na inspired revelation from God. Therefore God allowed him. To receive this thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. See, here's again a messenger of Satan. But the Lord allowed him to receive this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Some people say this messenger of Satan, this thorn in the flesh may have been an eye defect of the, of the apostle. That's why in some of his epistles, he did not write it. He, he was not the one who personally wrote it. He used an amanuensis. You know what an amanuensis now is? An amanuensis is a, just a secretary. Paul would tell his, his secretary, write this down. <clears throat> so that's the second reason. God allows adversity to come our way as a deterrent. In Paul's case, a deterrent to pride. In other words, it's to keep us humble. He was kept from conceit regarding the revelations he received. And therefore, this is to remind us of our source of blessings because God does resist the proud. James chapter 4, 6, and 7. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Anybody here, anybody here is humble? I thought I should put my hand down too. <laughs> God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Number three, God's purpose is it may be didactic. Didactic. It comes from the Greek word didaskolos, which means to teach us something. 
God allows us to go through adversity because He wants to teach us something. Turn, to, turn me to Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. Notice what the inspired text says. God's Word tells us that not only so, but we glory in tribulations, Paul says. We glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation works patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Okay. So it's didactic. We glory in tribulation. You know what the word tribulation here is? It's the Greek word thlipsis. The word means to squash. It means... Uh, Paul is saying we glory in being squashed or crushed. Have you ever said that? We glory in being crushed. Paul said. That means to be pressed together in all sides like grapes going through the wine press. Paul felt that way sometimes. Pressure on every side. That word thlipsis was used to describe an ancient mode of execution. What kind of execution? It was not uh, lethal injection. Ano yung lethal injection? Okay, patay natin tong criminal na to. Pero dapat yung pag, 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 pagkapatay sa kanya eh, humane. Yung hindi niya mararamdaman na mamamatay siya. Huh? Ngayon, bawal na nga yung lethal injection, di ba? But in ancient times, this was a form of execution. It, what did they do? They would place a huge rock on the chest cavity of a convicted criminal until he suffocates and dies. That's the word thlipsis. And I, guess, I suppose Paul in, some, in certain moments felt a stone placed on his chest and he would almost suffocate and feels like dying because of the intensity of his suffering, of his adversity. Have you ever felt like that? You felt suffocated because of the intensity of your trial? But Paul said, I, we glory in our tribulation. Because tribulation worketh what? Hupomone. Patience. The word hupomone or patience means to abide under. And, to, and this, base, this is not stoic, fatalistic passivity, just like the Muslims say, Allah wills it. This is not that kind of uh, patience that Paul is talking about. This is patience... That is, it's gallant, joyful, and willful endurance for the cause of Christ. In other words, no matter how, how intense our adversity may be, once we see God's purpose in this, you say, Lord, thank you for your wonderful purpose so we can go through the adversity with joyful and willful endurance. For the cause of Christ. And, and tribulation work of patience and patience and uh, it says and patience experience. This is tried and proven character. And of course experience hope. See. <clears throat> I've seen God work in the past. It's, it's like you and I saying, I could have seen God work in the past amid tough circumstances. And I know He will, he will uh, always sustain us in the present. A man can live 40 to 50 days without food. He can live 3 to 4 days without water. But 8 to 15 minutes without oxygen but a man cannot live one second without hope and this is why God gives us reveals to us his purpose amidst adversity number four letter D it may be not only disciplinary it not only be deterrent or didactic it may be demonstrative this is the case of Job why did God allow this to go through his, make him go through that trial? Job did not understand. It was incomprehensible. His three friends thought they had the, they had 
They're answers to the mind of God, to God's purpose. And to them, it was too simplified. You're going through suffering. There is sin in your life. Repent. Their, their, their theology was too limited. They did not understand that God can use adversity for a higher purpose. Even without sin. In the case of Job, it was demonstrative. In other words, you may be going to adversity because God wants you to be a demonstration of true faithfulness and godliness. No matter how high the cost. You see, it costs something to be a Christian. Christ died on the cross for our sins. But it costs a million times more not to be one. And you know, when Job went through his trial, did he hear one preacher say, this could be the best day of your life? I don't know. His friends said otherwise. You have seen in your life. But what did Job say? Job said, the Lord gave. You know what? Everybody can say that. The Lord taketh away. That everybody can say that. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Only the godly can say that. What a powerful statement of faith. Number Letter E. Another reason why God is allowing us to go to adversary. No matter how intense. No matter how incomprehensible. It may be discriminatory. In other words, God is, wants to distinguish you from others. It is to distinguish between two sets of things. To distinguish between the hypocrites and the martyrs. To distinguish between the heat, wheat and the chaff. The sheep and the goats. Matthew 13, 20 to 21 indicates that. When adversity comes, you know who goes? The martyrs? No, it's the hypocrites who go. Why? Because they're not made of the same stuff of the martyrs. The most eloquent proof of the resurrection, for instance, is that there were 11 cowardly disciples hiding behind locked doors, scared of their enemies. After the resurrection, they were willing to lay down their lives for the truth of the gospel. That's proof of the resurrection. Men do not die for lies. They die for the truth. And so though these 11 cowardly disciples came out preaching boldly the gospel in spite of threat from, from religious and political leaders. So it was discriminatory. And maybe it's the same for you. Letter F. It may be a disinfectant. What do we mean by that? In other words, God allows adversity to come our way because He wants to remove impurities in our lives. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. This is what Peter says. Chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Manifold. Heaviness, notice those language. Heaviness, manifold temptations or trials. So that, and what's the purpose? So that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So he wants to remove some impurities in our life. Proverbs chapter 17 and in verse 3 <clears throat> tells us <clears throat> that the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. But the Lord trieth the hearts. See, would you like God to, to purify you? then he will allow you to go through adversity. But there's one more. See, in all of these, it may be 
It may be disciplinary, it may be a deterrent, it may be didactic, it may be demonstrative, it may be discriminatory, it may be a disinfectant, but lastly, it is always developmental. John chapter 15, verse 2, it says, Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, did you notice? He purges it. So that it may bring forth more fruit. Jesus said. See the purging is always painful. But it is always productive. Because it is designed to enable us to bear more fruit. Let me close by turning you to Hebrews chapter 12 verses 5 through 11. Hebrews chapter 12 5 through 11. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. The right to addressing believers. My son, despise not now the chastening of the Lord, nor fate when thou art rebuked of him. Don't, dis don't despise God. When your parents discipline you, don't despise their parents. God plays them over you. And when God justices you, don't despise God. He has a purpose there. It says... Uh, Despise not now the chastened one or faint when thou art rebuked him for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. And if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. If God does not spank you, therefore you're not one of his. You need to receive Christ as your Savior. Furthermore, verse 9, you have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For they, our earthly parents, verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, so that we might be what? What's the purpose? Partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the moment, for the present, seems to be joyous, but it is grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Christian, you're going to adversity. It's always designed to enable us to bear more fruit. So let me close by citing you these words you see before honor comes humility before prosperity comes pro poverty before exaltation comes humiliation before joy comes sorrow and eventually at the end of the day there will, that death is going to come but before the resurrection comes death God had a purpose in allowing Joseph to go through adversity and it's the same God who is allowing us to go through the same. You say, Pastor, pray for me. I want God to have his purpose be accomplished in the midst of my adversity. I hope that's your prayer, for that is mine as well. And for myself and my family. Let us pray. Our Father, we come before you. Thank you for your word. If there is anyone here who is not trusted in Christ as Savior, watching this, Bring him under a conviction that he will flee from the wrath to come. He may finally take refuge, not in rituals or relics or rosary beads or religion, but in Christ alone who died for his sins and rose again for our justification. For those of us who are Christians, whatever our lot, we can say it is well with our soul. Because your purposes for affliction and adversity is always consistent with your character. And therefore, let your purposes have its way in us. Heads bowed, eyes closed, but no one looking around. Say, Pastor, pray for me. God spoke to my heart. I'm a Christian, and I know it. I've trusted Christ as my Savior. And Lord knows I'm going through a tough affliction. It is incomprehensible. It, it has come in multiples. Yes, when it rains, it does pour. 
And whatever your plot right now, say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm a Christian. I want God. Uh, there are moments when my mind, Satan plays tricks on my mind that I succumb to the purpose of the devil and therefore I feel defeated. I feel uh, despondent and depressed when you have a purpose. Therefore, uh, say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm praying for myself, my family, and together with you. Would you pray with me? Say, Pastor, let your purpose have its perfect work in us. Help us go through this trial <clears throat> with pay, joyful endurance, knowing your purpose is always good. Is that your prayer? We'd like to pray with you. Would you simply slip your hand? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Others more. Pray for me, Pastor. God spoke to me. It is good for me that I was afflicted. Oh, that I might learn thy statutes. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. God has his purpose. So let it, he, let it produce the intended fruit of righteousness. Is that your prayer? Anybody else would like to pray with you? And perhaps if you've not trusted Christ as Savior, I urge you to trust Him. We'd like to help you. We want to show you from an open Bible how to be sure of your salvation. Anybody? Before we close. Our Father in Heaven, again, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for its wealth of instruction. Thank You for its truthfulness. Thank You for...